Welcome to this stream. I'm Ahmed Chabuddin. Nigeria's presidential candidates are making their final bids for public support in what is expected to be one of the most closely contested elections in years. Millions of newly registered voters could ultimately decide who will be chosen to tackle a range of economic and security challenges. Here's what three of the leading candidates have been saying. We have knowledge, courage, we have the capacity. We are better, much better than others. If PDP is elected, we shall restore peace and order in Bonose, not only in Bonose, throughout the country. Once we win the election, that is the beginning of a new... It's the beginning of a new now. Joining us to discuss the election from Lagos, Renu Oduwala, project director at Hub NGR and a human rights advocate and community organizer. Idiot Hassan, director at the Center for Democracy and Development, a policy advocacy and research organization. She is joining us from Abuja. And last but not least, Eremo Egbejule is Africa editor at Al Jazeera. He is in Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. And of course, you can be part of the conversation here at the stream. Send us your thoughts through our live YouTube chat. Uh, I want to start with a basic kind of outline of the candidates. Let's start there, Aramo. Um, could you maybe talk us through these top four candidates, some of whom we just heard from there? Um, I'd say right away that this is um, an election where you have two candidates from the north, two from the south. Um, for the um, ruling party, the APC, you have Bola Tinubu, two-time former governor of Lagos, very, very powerful man. Um, you have Atiku Abubakar, who is the only one so far who has served at um, national level as vice president. Um, initially elected as governor of Adamawa, never served, went on to be vice president. Um, you have Peter B on the, the Labour Party, who is a two-term governor of, um, who has been a two-term governor of Anambra State in the southeast. And then you have Rabbi Ukwankwaso, who is the two-term governor of, uh, of Kano and was also a defense minister in the new Nigeria People's Party. Um, so I'd say it's an evenly spread thing. You know, these are men from um, mm -hmm. the four most populous uh, geopolitical zones of the six. Certainly, and it seems like the two-party system is being disrupted by Peter there, as you outlined. I want to ask you, Renu, um, maybe we take a step back. What's the mood in the country like I know that there have been a lot of concerns around the economy, inflation, high unemployment, particularly with youth. Um, how would you describe things a couple of days before the election? Well, thank you very much. I would say that uh, the reality of many Nigerians today is poverty, is insecurity, is poor leadership, um, institutionalized corruption, mm -hmm. inadequate. Uh, facilities currently i don't know if you know that we are experiencing even short scarcity um in currency of the naira in nigeria so there's there's a lot going on mm -hmm. uh in the country nigerians are probably at their last urge you know of, of, of falling over not to talk of police brutality and then the insecurity taking place in several parts of the country mm -hmm. we also have an unprecedented humanitarian crisis and not to forget the 60 over 60 percent youth unemployment rate in the country so there's a lot going on uh for nigerians mm -hmm. uh however still with the elections just like Aroma said there's considerable interest and involvement mm -hmm. especially from the youth angle um, many of them are open to participate. Some of them their first time, some of them their second times in these elections, um, so as to have a say in who the next country leaders are going to be. I dare say um, that the elections will be quite interesting. We've had a lot of polls, uh, a lot of comments, <sighs> contributions, and the most interesting part is nobody can really say who is going to be the next uh, president. So we will wait and we'll see in a matter of and, and, and I guess that's how, and I guess that's how it, it should be. I mean, you outlined so many challenges that the country is facing there. I want to ask you, Idiot, when you hear uh, your two colleagues there framing this uh, election, I know that Nigeria has been in recession twice just in the last seven years. A lot of people looking to the future, hoping for a real change. Um, how would you frame this election? What's the mood like for you? What's your major concern? I think this elections is both, we can say it's a make or mark. 
elections for Nigeria. On one hand, Nigerians mm. are very excited to be going to the polls. They feel finally that they have a better option aside from the two dominant parties. Now there is no excuse to say that you have to choose the lesser of the two evils. You have four formidable candidates, all with potentials of emerging winner uh, at one point or the other. And it's also an opportunity for them to renegotiate development. When you look at the enthusiasm, particularly amongst the young people, mm -hmm. you see that, look, this they're saying, like, look, the, we have the votes. We have over 39% on the registered voters list. And if we can harness her power, we can actually ensure that there is a change such yeah. that the economy can actually work for the young people. It can work for the poor. Such that these, the, all these challenges uh, of insecurity can finally be addressed. Yeah, I, I wanted and it's to also say would be a watershed you know, sure because if this opportunity sure, is sure. lost, yeah, if only God knows when. Yeah, so, so if this opportunity is lost, Renu, you wanted to jump in there? Go ahead. I mean, she's correct. If this opportunity is lost, I think that there'll be a lot of hopes that are crushed uh, for Nigerians because, well, like I said, we're literally at our last end and, and hoping that this could literally change the country forward. Uh, we can also see that what Formidayat is saying, there's a number, there's an increase in registered voters this election. Mm -hmm. And part of those numbers, a huge part of those numbers can be attributed to young people, meaning, like I said, well, there's considerable interest well, I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm, involvement for them to I, participate. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because because, you know, we, we actually saw, I think it's nearly 10 million new voters that have been registered, right? And 84% exactly. of them are under the age of 34. Over so 9 I've, million. Over 9, over 9 million, million and registered voters. In, in fact, I'd like to hear from some of them. This is a clip and from... And 7 million of them were young people. <laughs> fantastic. Here are all the stats that you need. Now, I want to share with you uh, what some of them have to say uh, after receiving their voting cards. This is from January. Take a listen voting for the first time, I'm very excited to wanting to do exercise my voting rights, voting the right people into government office to make Nigeria great and proud. For 2019, um, I felt we were still, the need, the need for change wasn't that high. But right now, something is very, very clear, that it's time that we transition to the younger generation ruling us. And that's why, if I don't do it now, when will I do it? Renu, I see that you're nodding there. I want to ask you, though, okay, there's some hope, there's some enthusiasm. They know that they're a big block. Maybe this is the moment that they're taken seriously. But I, I have to wonder, I mean, youth unemployment, a real issue in the country, no? Yes. Uh, and it has also contributed to a lot of apathy in the country. More than 60% of young people in Nigeria are unemployed. And if we can compare that to a country, they could literally be a country of their own. Um, also, we will look at the state of human rights yeah. in the country uh, that led to the widespread protest in 2020. You can see that there is a lot of dissatisfaction uh, with the system. But then, like I had said, uh, we, okay. as young people, do no longer have to choose between the devil and the blue sea right. uh, in order to be able to elect and him as a president. Now we have candidates that we can truly vouch for. And you can see that. I mean, not even Nigeria alone. The entire world can see uh, the enthusiasm of, of young Nigerians in the 2020. Right. And, 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 a lot of those young, and a lot of those young Nigerians, Eremo, if I'm not mistaken, supporting Peter Obi, or at least that's what it seems like from where I'm sitting, what would you like to add? It looked like you wanted to jump in there. Oh, no, no, I wanted to add to um, Rena's point about um, there are so many unemployed, unemployed people that it could be a country. Um, mm. From the latest statistics in 2022, we have 133 million Nigerians living in, um, in, in, in absolute poverty, right? That's more than the population of Ethiopia, and that's the second largest country in, um, in, uh, across the entire continent, right? So that's one. Another thing to note is this, right? There's immense, immense insecurity across many parts of Nigeria. In the north, you have Boko Haram and all of his offshoots, mm -hmm. ISWAP, um, and other, other factions, right? Mm. Um, children who were born in 2009, the year that the insurgency began, they will be eligible to vote in the next elections, right? So you have to look at the depth of problems that um, young people have seen and realized, okay, fine, we're going to have to vote. Um, about many people, uh, about many young people deciding to vote for Peter Obi, on the surface, yeah, things look like um, that's going to be the case. But we also have to remember one thing. Um, the Northwest is the most populous um, zone in the country, right? And um, there's also a lot of young voters there. We cannot presuppose that all of them are going to vote mm. for one particular candidate or another, right? But um, the one thing that we can agree on for sure is that uh, most of the voters, I think three, three quarters of the new voters, 
um, are young people. You know, some of them are students who have been at home. Um, last year, for example, last year, for example, there was a strike that lasted eight months, and that strike was the 15th or the 16th strike that lecturers have gone on since 1999. So you're averaging um, a strike every one or two years. Yeah. In the last 23 years, yeah. But but it Renu. is effective on Renu. that. Renu, go, go ahead. Let's hear from Renu first. Let's just hear yeah, from Renu first, young... if we can. Renu, go ahead. Then we'll come back to you. Go ahead. Yes, t talking about okay. talking about the the students, you know, who actually make up about forty percent um, of the new voters that that have recently been registered. You see, a recent presidential candidate also telling them that they would spend eight years in school rather than the usual four years, and I dare say that many of them um, and and the national, I think. The Nigerian University Commission has also um, ensured that students go back to vote. So many of them are going to actually be taking part in these elections and be showing their anger and frustration at the system that has kept them at home for almost a year. Also, I think a lot of them are frightened about the promises from the different presidential candidates. I mean, how can you say that I will? You're promising me that I will spend more years than than I should in in in, in, the, in the school. So I think that's yeah. a threat, and a lot of them are going to be taking and that quite seriously. Fair Let's enough. Go ahead. Then. Fair enough. Idiot, go ahead. Okay. Okay, but it's also important to highlight that young people, it's not a monolithic category. Mm -hmm. Most of these young people are actually supporting Ms. Peter Obi while others are supporting Kwakwen. So fanatically, while the others are supporting the two dominant sure. party candidates as well. So it cuts across, it spread, it depends on the turnout on the day of elections itself. And I'm sure that in a few days we will be knowing by the time we are able to analyze the numbers of people who have actually collected their permanent voters card and which category they do actually belong to. I appreciate the nuance. Was, go ahead, go ahead, Ermo. No, no, I was just going to add to, again, to that point, right, and say that um, there's sometimes, you know, those of us who are commentators from the south of Nigeria, there's a tendency to look at things from um, only one point of view and to see oh, one part of the country as monolithic or oh, to box people's voting preferences into one category to assume that people's levels of education are somewhat linked to who they will vote all the time, right? And so it's important to note that um, while we can see um, the, the, the momentum that's being generated by one or so of the candidates, right, in mm -hmm. the South, um, people in the North or, or in the center of the country, for example, you know, they also have their own preferences. Um, uh, so I think that's also something to note because we are very quick in the South to assign voting um, preferences and, you know, um, and, and candidates to set in um, demography. No, most certainly. And I, I, I really appreciate, you know, that you making us understand, you know, it's not as if all the youth vote in one way or all women vote in one way or even one ethnic group or what have you. Um, I do want to share with you, because the three of you outlined so um, in such detail sort of all the mounting challenges, let's listen to what Coco Pumpuni Asante had to say, outlining some of the key challenges uh, Nigerians face. Take a look. There are four key challenges I see to the upcoming Nigeria elections. First is the bimodal verification, uh, voter verification system, the BVAS, and how it's going to perform on, on election day particularly how quickly the INEC is able to respond to breakdowns. The second issue uh, has to do with the, uh, the new notes, the Naira notes uh, that are, are scarce, and then also the fuel shortages, and that, how that is going to affect movement on election day. And the third issue is to do with insecurity and how widespread uh, it will be uh, on election day, and whether it will impact on the turnout. And lastly, it's uh, disinformation and misinformation and how the, the general electorate are going to respond or react to false information that's disseminated on election day. Idiot, at the end there, one of the challenges we haven't discussed is disinformation. How do you think that's factoring into this election? Is it? I think that's one of the biggest challenges in these elections because information is actually being weaponized. And there is actually a thin line between the online and the offline in Nigeria. So when people think about just like 30, 2 million, over 32 million people online, how does that get to the over 200 million uh, Nigerians? It's just like, mm. like this. It's, mm. 
it's very, very broad. And what is being said online is actually imparting candidates offline. And in a different, in different sets of way. In these elections, we are seeing that people are not even, they are weaponizing information to glorify their candidates. We are hearing of some spurious things some candidates have done when we know they are not really achievable. It's been used to delegitimize opposing candidates as well as institution, which plays a very important role. Mm -hmm. By the time you listen to Kojo talking about the bimodal voter accreditation system, yeah. because now people do not even have trust in that system. People cannot sift right from wrong. Right. Or the voters register itself as a challenge while they are, as much as possible, weaponizing malinformation in this election. Right. And, you know, Renu, I have to say, weaponizing misinformation, it seems like, as you said at the beginning of this conversation, nobody really knows Who's going to win? But with that said, um, there have been so many different concerns uh, about things, including the central bank. I was reading earlier today, people not being able to withdraw money, as we heard. Um, actually, let me, let me play this clip for our audience. It's a man in northern uh, Nigeria who's angry, uh, specifically at the fuel and cash shortages. Take a listen. Everybody's angry with the government. Because we queue for what? For your own money that is in your bank, you queue for it. Government collected all our money. They told us to deposit all our money into the bank. That after the 31st, they will give us back our money. But now you cannot access your own money. Which kind of government is this? I mean, he asked the question there, Renu. What's your answer? Well, just like he said, uh, the government asks us to deposit our own money and we can't even collect it. Uh, but then it's it's important to note that this is not the first time that this government will be doing such a thing. Buhari mm. was our military head of state in 1984. And the same disastrous policy was enacted then where people couldn't collect their money. Many are on the side of government saying that it will uh, ensure that politicians are able are not able to buy votes. And many are saying that the hardship is simply too much. The government is absent in a lot of people's lives and still they cannot access their own money to buy the, the things that they need with their own money. So like the man said, a lot of Nigerians are angry and I expect that to show in these elections. Um, vote buying will be high. Vote buying is already on the way because of the issues that that we've mentioned earlier for me, diet from everyone more from uh, Dr. Kojo as well, that mm -hmm. Nigerians are truly going through a lot. And like I said, the vote buying is on the way. But a lot of Nigerians are also going to be voting um, based on issues that matter most to them, based yeah. on the fact that in one of the world's most pop, uh, 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 biggest biggest oil producers, we do not even have well. There's full scarcity currently uh, in the country. The fact that um, the person who promised us I was going to eradicate I corruption came into the country uh, as, as, a, as a president and more corruption even in March. So a lot of Nigerians are angry, right. just like you saw in the... In the and as a young pe think, per person as well, I'll be voting on issues that matter most to me as the social issues. So I, um, I think that these are what Nigerians will be voting on. And, 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 I, that. and I'm glad that you're repeating this line. I know that you wanted to jump in there, Aramo, but, but, but this idea that Nigerians are angry, I want to share with you a comment that's in our uh, YouTube chat here from Bonaventure, Eugene, saying the voter turnout will be massive, but I hope thugs won't disrupt or create fear among voters. That anger, might it turn into violence? Aramo, what were you going to jump in and say? I was going to jump in and say that Nigeria is a country where you know, new paradoxes are born every day. Right. Imagine telling someone else that um, Africa's largest oil producer for many years has never had um, um, electricity for 24/7, like uninterrupted power mm. supply, mm. or um, has to um, import fuel. You know, even though and, like it's, it's just a nation where you know there's all sorts of impossibilities happening every day. Now, see for example um, this cash swap and um, cash scarcity thing in Nigeria. What is going to happen as a result of this? The outcome is going to be that you know. The unbanked people who were trying to draw into the banks before, they're going to be even more distrustful of the system. You know, because this person is going to tell you, for example, oh, I had my money underneath my bed, you know, and now you asked me to bring it, but I can't withdraw it, right? You know, so that's going to be um, something that's going to affect the banking system mm. uh, for years to come. And so that anger is going to be weaponized um, by so many people in this election, right? You're going to obviously see uh, a much lighter turnout. That's what I'm predicting, that you see a much lighter turnout um, at elections than there has been in the last two um, electoral cycles. Well, and maybe that, maybe that wouldn't be necessarily the worst thing. I mean, I don't want to be flippant about it, but I, 
But I do. I it do, wouldn't be. <laughs> it wouldn't be. I on, on, on the violence, on the violence you mentioned, you know, um, me. the elections are quite tense. There's a lot of tense tension in the country currently. Uh, we have a lot of issues that we're combating right from the northeast to the to the north. In fact, every part of the country is is almost in chaos right now due to the insecurity that is happening. Well. Um, and, 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 and this so insecurity, just for our audience, if I can, Renu, I just want to share, like, you know, in the north, in the south. I, I think there are two please, issues. Please go ahead. Go ahead, idiot. All right, it seems as though we're having a little bit of a lag there. Renu, you were saying something, um, and I yes, think, I, yeah, I wanted continue. to show the clip uh, that, that you were about to show regarding the fact that a lot of criminals are actually operating in different parts of the country. If you look at you see that so part of are no longer in control uh, of the government any longer. Uh, they're now in control. They're now in, in, in hands of uh, criminal criminal elements and all of that. And, and, and I think your, your, your audio is cutting out there, but we did want to share and just visualize for our audience, you know, in the Northwest, a lot of concerns around banditry, also in the Islamic State affiliates, of course, Boko Haram in the Northeast. In the Southeast, there are separatist movements. In the central areas, of course, there's the conflict with the farmers. This is just what I was trying to share with our audience to, to visualize what you were saying about, you know, much of the country, if not all of the countries in crisis. And with that in mind, often when there's a crisis, I think of who can solve that? Well, maybe women. I want to ask you, um, you know, because we've, we've talked a lot about this might being, you know, this election maybe it being an opportunity for women. Uh, we do have a clip of one woman who's running for a state governorship. Of course, it's a separate round of voting uh, for those who are not familiar with the Nigerian election system, but still very much aiming to break that glass ceiling there. Take a listen. This is a moment female activists in Nigeria have worked for. A woman from a major political party becoming a candidate for governor. And she is a front runner. Aisha Tubinani overcame religious and cultural barriers in the patriarchal society to get here. She says it's been worth the struggle. It gives women, it gives our daughters, it gives our sisters, our aunties, our mothers the confidence that yes, oh, so uh, women can walk towards occupying whatever elective position they desire. Renu, I'm curious, are you enthusiastic that th this may be a shift uh, for women all over the country in terms of being kind of uh, galvanized to, to, to occupy higher uh, offices? On one hand, I am sad because if you look at the 2019 elections as opposed to the 2023 elections, you will see that there is a decline in the number of women political um, candidates who are coming up in the political sphere in Nigeria, which means that there's, a, there's an issue if there could be a reduction instead of an increase. Mm. Uh, recently as well, you've had attacks on, and, and that cannot be unsure, you know, uh, uh, you can trace that to the recent attacks on the, you know, women leaders, um, political candidates. Recently, a woman leader was killed in Kaduna. A woman mm. leader of the Labour Party was assassinated. And mm. so there's a lot of um, political violence get towards women in Nigeria, they are not usually seen as people who should lead. So on one hand, I'm sad that we have less women who are contesting for uh, for political seats. On the other hand, you have women like this, and all of the uh, wonderful women who are ensuring um, that they stand their ground, irrespective of the political climate, irrespective of the fact that our political systems are run by godfathers and all of that, they're still standing their ground to ensure um, they're adequately, that women are adequately represented. So I dare say Nigerians, Go ahead, vote for these women, um, because they will change the future. Thank you. All right, I, I think go I ahead. Want to add that, yeah. I, I want to add that it will be a very, very important um, two-for-one victory if I shall be named those women in Damala State. Because on the one hand, Nigeria will have its first ever female elected governor. But on the other hand, right, this is a Damala State. It's in the Northeast. This is the same region where um, six, eight years ago, Boko Haram kidnaps young girls mm. because... Um, they are, yeah, because your mantra is that Western education is forbidding. So it would not just, uh, it would also be a boost for female education and female empowerment generally across that region, the Northeast. And uh, of course, I appreciate you ending on that note. That's sadly all the time we have for today's conversation. But of course, so many concerns around the queues, the voter registration process, and even on YouTube, as we've heard from some people concerned that polling stations across the country might not all be open. So a conversation we will continue here, where you can always find us online at stream.aljazeera.com. Thanks to our guests. Thanks for watching.